My name's Amata, and in this Red Gaming Tech video, I'm here with the latest from the tech world on the last 24 or so hours. I promise you, no April Fool shenanigans. It's, of course, way past 12 o'clock here. But that doesn't seem to be a thing anymore, that particular restriction. All day I've been reading articles. Like, yeah, I'm so edgy and cool, and I'm like, no, you're really not. Anywho, what have I got for you today? Well, we're going to kick things off with a rather lengthy video regarding Razer and their financials. Then we have some comments from the NVIDIA CEO Jensen Huang about cryptocurrency, kind of downplaying the whole role in that business. And then finally, we have an MSI motherboard, which is for mining, which has a staggering 13 PCIe slots. But as I said, let's begin things with Razer. Now, I do have a couple of details on their IPO situation, but let's begin things with their earnings. That's the most interesting part, I would say. So year-on-year -year revenue grew a th impressive 32.1% to 517.9 million US dollars. The gross margin also grew just underneath that from 27.9% to 292 We also did see a growth in loss to 165.8 million versus the 59 million that we saw in 2016. That is quite the significant growth in loss, I'm sure you will agree, but it's not as big a deal as it might seem simply because well they still grew in revenue and gross margin by a rather impressive amount. Now I didn't mention the whole IPO situation which of course is initial public offering basically they became a publicly available company you can buy stocks in them if you so desire and all that good stuff there was initial offering of 388 Hong Kong dollars and it eventually reached a peak of 549, does now stand around 286, but basically Razer have said that the money being raised by the OPO is going to be basically put into increasing various things. We're going to see a 25% to develop new verticals in gaming and digital entertainment, including mobile. We see 25% to financial acquisitions, 20% to R&D, 20% to sales and marketing, and then 10% for general working capital. So they're basically going to put this money to good use to obviously expand their company and expand what they have to offer us. And the reason this is relevant to their revenue is the one of the main reasons for this loss might actually be part of the non-cash share based compensation and listing expenses for the IPO and obviously we're getting obviously not various other non-operating factors and that sort of thing but the IPO definitely played a role in that increase in loss but it's obviously hard to say exactly how much of an increase it uh, how much of a role sorry it played in that increase but Razer themselves are saying that a lot of it is just down to the fact that they obviously have entered the smartphone market. So a lot of initial R&D, production costs, marketing costs, all that sort of stuff. And it was obviously a new thing for them. So that plus the OPO does a kind of account for this rather large ballooning in the amount of loss. But despite that, again, they have still managed to get a rather impressive increase in revenue and gross margin. So it's interesting to see the long-term fallout from not only the IPO, but of course their entry into the smartphone business, and of course any of the factors that we may or may not see coming. So let's move on to NVIDIA. Now this is kind of timely as of course AMD just the other day were kind of downplaying the impact that the, shall we say, expected burst of the whole cryptocurrency bubble it would have on their company and now we have Jensen Huang basically distancing himself and of course Nvidia from the Bitcoin market and he said quote we're not involved in Bitcoin at all Bitcoin mining is done largely by ASICs today what uses our GP is Ethereum. Ethereum Ether was designed as an algorithm to ensure, ensure rather, that no single entity or a few entities has the power to control the Ether. It was designed so the algorithm requires the type of computing capabilities, the type of processing capabilities that are made possible by the use of GPUs in a distributed system. The reason why the GPU is so popular with Ethereum is because the GPU is the single largest distributed supercomputer in the world. It is the only supercomputer that is literally in everyone's hands. As a result, no single single entity can control currency. Now, Jensen seemed equally unfazed as AMD as to the Susquehanna, Susquehanna, I'm genuinely not sure on the pronunciation, um, analyst who basically said that there's going to be a hit to both AMD and NVIDIA due to the release of ASICs that are capable of mining Ethereum being released to the market soon and again AMD we're not that bothered and neither do NVIDIA seem all that bothered now cryptocurrency did account for roughly 6% of graphics card sales 
last year, that is only 6%. Obviously, it's still a lot of money because, you know, each graphics card is so expensive and obviously the price has been increasing due to demand and all that sort of stuff. So I'm not saying it's like 5p, but it's not like, oh, it's 50% or something like that. But same as NVIDIA, uh, sorry, say as AMD, same as AMD, NVIDIA are kind of saying like, look, you know, we're making our graphics cards available. We're kind of struggling with demand. They're definitely sort of supporting the cryptocurrency mar market because they would be mad not to, but they're definitely not putting the eggs in that basket if you take the words for what they are. And Jensen finished up what he had to say, quote, quite frankly, I prefer that the GPs are available in those areas, that being, you know, gaming and AI and all that sort of stuff. And the reason is that there is so much shortage of GPUs at the moment, it's hard for us to keep stock. So again, same thing as AMD, basically, yes, they're aware that cryptocurrency is, you know, obviously a section of the market that they have to concern themselves with. They're not going to invest too much into it, and they're not overly fussed by the analysts' comments, and not overly worried about any impact these ASICs might have on them overall as a company. Now, of course, we can only wait and see as to what actually happens when these Ethereum ASICs actually release. It could be that AMD and NVIDIA are right, it could actually be great for them as people will start buying them instead of actual gaming graphics cards and we can finally see the price decrease or we might not see a change at all. It really does depend on how good these ASICs actually are, how popular they are, how well known they are, all that sort of stuff. So we have to wait and see but definitely going to be a, a game of like who's right and who's wrong when these ASICs finally come out to see how much of an impact if any it has on both of these companies. So let's go to our final item of today, which is related to mining with MSI. Slightly off topic rant there, but still. It is interesting nonetheless to see a motherboard like this <laughs> again. I'm gonna... So speaking of mining, we have a rather crazy motherboard made by MSI that is definitely targeting that demographic. It's pretty clear that it's wearing its mining influence on its sleeve, as it were. Now, this is a Coffee Lake motherboard, as most miners do intend, so do tend to use Pentium and Celeron. So this motherboard definitely targets them with pretty much every fiber of its being. As I said in the introduction to this particular video, it can support up to, sorry, it has up to 13 PCIe slots, which is pretty crazy. And we also have Molex power connectors provided for additional GPU power. Now, unsurprisingly, MSI have cut every corner possible because there's a lot of features that might be in, say, a gaming motherboard that just isn't needed. For example, there's no heatsink on the VRM, and there's a small one on the south bridge. And also, we only see a single HDMI connector alongside a single DVI. Normally, you get a single HDMI and then a couple of DVIs or what have you, depending on your flavor. And we also have two DDR4 DIMMs and four fan connectors. So, you know, it's not hobbled by any means, but you can definitely tell what this motherboard and who this motherboard is intended for. So, yeah, the very first mining motherboard for Coffee Lake CPUs, and it's rather interesting to look at. It's a very strange looking motherboard just because, well, we don't really see this layout very often on a consumer level motherboard. You know, the sort of thing that might use 13 PCIe slots is normally like, you know, it's as epic or um, Xeon, that sort of thing. But nope, this is just, just for mining, pretty much. So. Pretty crazy. Let me know your thoughts, guys, on everything discussed in this video. I hope you're having a wonderful Easter, and I'll see you next time.